Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks. Isn't it warm down here? Isn't it nice and toasty and cozy? Oh, look at us. Very good. I'm so glad that we uh, decided to stay and, and hear uh, Deacon Reyes. He's, he's a wonderful speaker. You're going to really enjoy it. Um, I am privileged to introduce him. Uh, Deacon Henry is a husband of 21 years. You said 22. Yeah, Did you have year, an anniversary? All right, very good. Happy anniversary. Uh, to Patty, his beautiful bride. He is the father to five marvelous, five marvelous and challenging children, ages 11 to 18. He is a permanent deacon in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee for seven years and a business owner going on 13 years. He used to teach as a profession and has advanced degrees in theology and philosophy. Deacon Henry loves to fish. He loves to make maple syrup, yum, and play basketball with his kids. Please help me welcome Deacon Henry Lewis. Well, good morning. I'd like to uh, begin with prayer. And so if we could rise, if you can. Everything that we do, we do with the help of God. And so we sign ourselves with the sign of our faith in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I'd like to invite you to this place. Holy Spirit, come. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We ask you, sweet Virgin Mary, to be with us, protect us, guide us to your Son, Jesus. And we say, Hail Mary. O Christ, our Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> So I think the, um, many of you don't know who I am, so I'm a deacon at uh, St. Anthony and St. Hyacinth Parishes in Milwaukee. Um, been a deacon there for seven years. Uh, been in Milwaukee basically my entire life since second grade. Uh, I saw during the uh, check-in moment at the beginning of Mass that someone checked in from San Juan, Puerto Rico. That's pretty far. But I know where that is because that's where I'm from. <laughs> so um, we went last uh, last December, we went to Puerto Rico, took my kids for the first time. They, um, it was a whole new experience for them. Um, I come to you in the name of Jesus, as the son of Mary, owing God everything that I am and that I have. In humility, as Many of you have many more years of experience than I do in marriage. And in humility, because the experience of every person is so precious. The insights that you've gained over the years are so precious that I wish we could speak to each other, not just me speak to you. But as it is, this is how we set things up. So, um, I will be speaking to you, even though I want to hear you as well. So, um, if you had seen me speak before, you would know that I always bring a sheet. So, I brought a sheet, a hand up, because um, I want you guys to take something home. Learn something here and take something home. Um, I think we have enough that if one per family, you know, one per 
family takes one, we should have more than enough. If we have leftovers, then we can have, you know, individuals take extra. Okay. Uh, what's being passed around is a sheet that has two. It's actually two sheets together. One is um, highlights of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is a section on matrimony. Okay. There's a whole section on sacraments, and uh, this is one of the sections. Um, I highlighted uh, kind of important uh, passages, and. But the, and when I did it on the computer, everything was very light, like highlighter, and when I printed it, it the, the blue was kind of dark, so I apologize. Um, and then the second part is a uh, selection of um, scripture passages that speak uh, about, speak to uh, marriage. Um, as they said, um, I, I am married. I've been married uh, for now 21, going on 22 years. Um, like most uh, permanent deacons, uh, are married, 95%. Um, I didn't uh, ever think I'd be a deacon. I thought marriage was the vocation that God had chosen for me. Um, the reason I say that is because when I was dating my, now my wife, um, I had not yet proposed to her. And uh, the old ladies at church would grab me by the cheek and say, you would make a great priest. <laughs> oh. And then I thought, you know, what, what do they know? Come on, yeah, it's just, that they, I bet they say that to everyone. Then a different person said also. And then a different person. And I said, hmm, hmm, hmm. This is a little bit too much coincidence, so I need to make sure before I proposed this beautiful girl I was dating, that God was not in fact calling me to something else. And so I went to the discernment retreat for the weekend. Imagine that conversation. Hey, sweetheart, uh, I'm gonna go for the weekend to the priest discernment retreat. Um, and so, you know, she kind of held her breath and said, okay, talk to you on Sunday when you come back. And uh, so I went. Uh, they do these on a regular basis, actually, for discernment. There was uh, there were guys there who were discerning the priesthood, uh, some of whom are priests in our diocese now. And there were women discerning a call to the religious life. And so we met with like all these vocation directors and all these people, and they um, had us go through all these exercises, and we spent all this beautiful time in nature and talking to them. And, I said, here I am, Lord. Speak, Lord, for I'm listening. And he didn't say anything. It was a beautiful retreat. I felt very at peace there. But there was not, nothing from him. So I came back on Sunday. I said, hey, sweetheart. I think we got the green light. <laughs> so I went 100% without doubts about marrying my, my girlfriend. I proposed to her, um, and we were married a couple years later. And um, it's been quite an adventure since then. Um, there's so many things, um, there's so much confusion about what is marriage, what is matrimony in the society, and different people have different ideas. I, I thought it'd be nice for you to see what the church actually teaches about uh, the sacrament of matrimony. So I highlighted some of the parts that are in the section on marriage in the catechism. So I'm just gonna go through these, because these were the highlights anyways. So um, if you want the full chapter, I did put a QR code in the back. I forgot to tell you that before I got my degrees in theology, my first degree was in computer science. <laughs> yeah, it's funny like that. Um, so yeah, I put a QR code there and a, and a little link so that if you want the full chapter, not just the, the highlights but the rest of it, um, it's there as well as the scripture passages. Okay. Or if if you didn't get a handout and you want to just look at it on your phone, just borrow someone's QR code from next to you. Okay. 
paragraph 1602 says, Sacred scripture begins with the creation of man and woman in the image and likeness of God. And concludes with a vision of the wedding feast of the Lamb. That's the, the beginning and the end of the scriptures in Genesis and in Revelation. Scripture speaks throughout of marriage and its mystery, its institution, and the meaning God has given it. Scripture returns to the image of marriage over and over again. There are two things that are repeated when it comes to our relationship with God. One is covenant, and one is marriage. And marriage is a kind of covenant. Paragraph 1603, God himself is the author of marriage. 1604, God who created man out of love also calls him to love, the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being. Um, I taught high school for eight years, and uh, I love, I love it, teaching high school, I love teenagers. They're a little tough sometimes, but, but when you love something, it doesn't seem tough to you. And so I love them. I love the really hard ones, you know? The ones that like sat in the back like this. <laughs> what are you gonna teach me today? Uh, I don't know, because your arms are crossed, probably nothing. <laughs> but I'll say hello. Hey. Okay. Next day, hello. Hey. Next day, next day. I got them all here. Next day. At the end of the school year, hey, what's happening? How's your weekend? Yeah, what's going on? You got your homework? Yeah, sure, of course, of course. Okay, nice, nice. I want to read what you have to say because he matters to me. She matters to me. One of the things about bad students is that they feel like they matter to no one because only students who get A's matter to me. And they can't do that or won't do that. Do they matter to me? A, B, C, D, whatever. Make any difference. The vocation of every human being is to love. Period. That is our vocation. We are made in the image and likeness of God, and God Himself is love. When those young people were lost and they were, you know, like literally depressed every day in my class, I go, okay, what's, what's going on? What's happening? And they start to explain to me all the problems, which unbelievable amount of problems that people can have. They felt that perhaps their vocation was to suffer. Like they hated their lives. Because that's not our vocation. Our vocation is to love. And if you suffer while you're loving someone, that happens a lot, actually. That's okay. So I suffer sleep deprivation to get up and feed and change one of my twins. But guess what's going to happen in about 30 minutes? I'm going to get up, feed and change the other twin. And then we're going to repeat that process every two hours. That, I suffer through that out of love. That's okay. But when people suffer and not out of love, life becomes so miserable. Everything is dark, everything is terrible, the future is bleak, everything. And so as a religion teacher, I'm like, ooh, we got a couple of students here who need to know a little bit about this. And so then I would work it into the lesson, you know, whatever the lesson we were, we were studying. And so um, God calls us to love. Since God created man and woman, their mutual love becomes an image of the absolute and unfailing love with which God loves man. So the love of people is a reflection of God. We are made in his image and likeness. So let's put it this way. The, the best qualities we have are a reflection of God. So do you know someone who is very hospitable? It makes you feel welcome. You know, anybody know somebody like that? Maybe, maybe it was your grandma, or maybe it was somebody at church, or who knows? 
when that person acts that way, they are reflecting a little piece of what God is like. <coughs> or in the school setting, when the school, when a, when a teacher really cares about a student, it's a little reflection about what God is like. And so our human love, our commitments to one another, are meant to be a reflection of God in, in every kind of way. We're made in his image and likeness. Holy Scripture affirms that man and woman were created for one another. Uh, if you've ever studied the uh, theology of the body of St. Uh, John Paul II, he begins there. So there's an initial solitude so that if Adam was created and Eve had not been created yet. And he, he felt alone. He was, he was deeply, deeply alone because the animals just animals, it was nice, they were there. Until so Eve was created, then he understood himself better, and he understood that he was made for her and she for him. That was the, it said, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. This one, it's like me. Unfortunately, we read in the uh, Genesis that sin entered the world says every man experiences evil around him and within himself. Uh, this would be women too, right? Every woman experiences evil around her and within herself. This experience makes itself felt in the relationships between man and woman. Their union has always been threatened by discord, a spirit of domination, infidelity, jealousy, and conflicts that can escalate into hatred and separation. So sin is part of our equation, and yet our call is very high. So our call is very high, we're supposed to be loving and, and reflecting God's image, and yet we cannot do that very well because there's sin in the world. And that's so, not only in the world, but in me as well. So, One of the ways we see that is, you know, people want to get their way. I want to get my way. So that's kind of a sinful, right? Instead of a generous, humble thing, it's kind of a sinful, egotistical thing. So what are we having for dinner? Let me ask you. What are we having for dinner? The, the correct answer is whatever I want. You see? If you're, if you're self-centered, then you don't care what the other people want. You care what you want. And so that enters into our relationships. That's a very minimal example, right? But it's true. I, I did a, a talk for couples, and I said to them, I said, look, look just, just try it. Try it at home. You know? Well, what, what, do you wanna, what do you wanna have for dinner? Well, whatever you want, sweetheart. Well, I want to deliver her with, you know, whatever. And you're like, deliver <laughs> I don't know, I, uh, <clears throat> anything else <laughs> besides that. Try it. Just let them have their liver. And you try it too, at least a little piece. Who knows, maybe one day they'll say, what would you like for dinner? Oh, I, I, I want some big juicy burgers. That's what I want for dinner. Okay, I mean, this, that, you know, it's all greasy and stuff. I don't really want that, but okay. That starts to get to what it means to love, right? It's, it's, what do I prefer? I prefer your good. So that, that sinfulness enters, right? And so it's tough to say no to ourselves for the good of the other person. You have to kind of mature a little bit to make that happen. According to faith, the disorder we notice so painfully does not stem from the nature of man and woman, nor from the nature of the relations, but from sin. As, is, as break with God, the first sin had for its first consequence the rupture of the original communion between man and woman.
Nevertheless, the order of creation persists. Though seriously disturbed, to heal the wounds of sin, man and woman need the help of the grace of God in his infinite mercy that he never refuses them. Without his help, man and woman cannot achieve the union of their lives for which God created them in the beginning. That is a beautiful teaching and something that people should like, I don't know, put on a, like a placard or a billboard or something, maybe in simpler language, right? But if we're gonna achieve the end to which God created us, which is to image his goodness and his good qualities, we're gonna need his grace and we're gonna need lots of it. And, but luckily he's, he's willing to give it to us, right? So after the fall, Marriage helps to overcome self-absorption, egoism, pursuit of one's own pleasure, and to open oneself to the other, to mutual aid, and to self-giving. You know, every family is different, right? Your, your dynamic is different than mine. Um, in our family, so my siblings, so I have two siblings older than me, are very sick people. They're like, they've been sick my whole life. To me, that's just normal, right? Um, my wife is a doctor. Okay, got it. Got it. It's funny like that. So she's good in emergencies as well. And I've had lots of practice in emergencies. So when there's an emergency in my home, everything's like clockwork. Everything runs so smooth. For most people, it would be the opposite, right? So you have emergencies like, oh, what's good? what are we going to do? Nope, not us. Oh, we gotta go to the emergency room. Okay, let's go. Get the babysitter around the line, let's get this, boom, 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 boom. You take that car, take this car, let's go. And we do it all in one minute. Because my life and my family, so that's a different marriage, right? The marriage of my parents. My wife and her family, the marriage of her parents, we're now together and our marriage becomes a giving of ourselves to the other. What, what does she need? I've got her back. You need, you need this? Okay, got it. You got it. And it all comes out when there's an emergency. It just comes out. It's actually, a, except for the fact that it's an emergency, it's a beautiful thing. I'll give you an example. Um, I have five kids, so the oldest was late. She was, she was 41 weeks already, and she, she needed to come out right. She, late. So we're going to go for an induction that day. It was Monday morning but my mom my wife went into labor that night so or you know the previous day and into the night and so finally around two in the morning she said you know what i think these are coming pretty frequently we should go okay so, you know of course i'm first time dad i'm like okay okay okay, 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 okay. gotta get the bank gotta get the thing gotta get the, the wife into the car okay let's go and so we're walking down the stairs to to leave to have our first child and my dad is there at the bottom of the steps with my brother go it's two in the morning. What are you guys doing now? Oh, uh, yeah. So dad needs to go to the ER. Oh. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's feeling bad. And I'm like, Hi, how are you doing, dad? Hi, I don't feel right. Okay, all right. Um, sure, sure. Let's make this happen. Let's do it. I'm gonna drop you guys off in the ER on the way to having my first child. So that's exactly what we did. I said, you take care of my dad. I will go with my wife, take care of her. And then we'll like reconvene in a couple days. <laughs> That's my life. That literally like happens all the time. Um, okay. So marriage helps to get us out of ourselves. I would say having children also does that. The nuptial covenant between God and his people Israel had prepared the way for the new and everlasting covenant in which the Son of God, by becoming incarnate and giving, and giving his life, had united to himself in a certain way all mankind saved by him, thus preparing for the wedding feast of the Lamb. So the nuptial covenant between God and his people, I will be your God and you will be my people. That is a covenant that he made with them. That he would be with them always. And 
They were not super faithful to the covenant, but he was faithful. That is very, that's a lot of marriage imagery in, on the prophet. If you read the prophets, a lot of marriage imagery. On the threshold of, of his public life, Jesus performs his first sign at his mother's request during a wedding feast. Remember the wedding feast at Cana? They have run out of wine, which in the scriptures represents joy. So whenever they talk, the symbolism of wine is always joy. They have run out of joy. Very symbolic that, that story. <coughs> and water, what's water used for? In fact, the one the water they gave him. What was the water that they gave him was used for? Big old jugs. Used for? for washing. Very ordinary kind of water. That's all they had. Just the work. Just the cleaning. Uh, so some of you have cleaned for years and decades and so long that you're just sick of it. That's just a normal part of life. But Jesus enters the, the, the equation and wants to bring joy into that place. Beautiful. The union, the matrimonial union of man and woman is indissoluble. God himself has determined it, that what therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. By coming to restore the original creation disturbed by sin, he himself gives the strength and grace to live marriage in the new dimension of the reign of God. It is by following Christ, renouncing themselves, and taking up their crosses that spouses will be able to receive the original meaning of marriage and live it with the help of Christ. This grace of Christian marriage is a fruit of Christ's cross, the source of all Christian life. So, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, as I've been reading, we've been going from the Old Testament through the prophets to the New Testament. So now we've just been mentioning Jesus Christ. This is the New Testament. When Jesus comes, he uh, fulfills what the prophets were going to, were announcing. He fulfills the plan that God had told the people, you will, you will be my people, I will be your God. He fulfills everything. Jesus is the fulfillment of the expectations of human beings. Okay, don't look for another. Okay, we, we have found the way. Right? That, was the, that was the reading today. Um, Tells Peter, I have found the Messiah. We have found the Messiah. <coughs> so through Christ, marriage now becomes possible, even in a world that has <coughs> sin, because Christ Himself has a plan to strengthen our marriages through His cross. So if we do not unite ourselves to His cross, then we miss the grace. And I know nobody likes to the word suffering and you know difficulty, but it is part of our Christian like honor. Because we don't just suffer, we suffer for. We suffer for our spouse, we suffer for um, someone who need, really needs it. Uh, someone who's sick, someone who for our children. And so we join ourselves to him so that we can receive that grace that he won for us. And so take up your cross and follow me. Right in the scripture passage, he says, if you want to be my disciple, here's what you got to do. You got to, actually before he says take up the cross, there's something else. Does anybody know what he says before? He says you must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. So there's the, like the un, inconvenient truth, right? That, that marriages have the strength to work through Christ, right? But without Christ, then it's very, very difficult. This is what the Apostle Paul makes clear when he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives. Christ loved the church. That's a very high standard 
By the way, um, one of the things that our society does to us is that it lowers our standards, right? So I didn't kill anybody today, so I'm, I'm pretty good. Did you? No? Well, we're both pretty good. You know, and it's like such a low standard. So, you know, to raise the standard, Christianity is a very high standard faith. Our role model and our goal and our standard is Christ. The entire Christian life bears the mark of the spousal love of Christ and the church. Already, baptism, the entry into the people of God, is a nuptial mystery. It is so to speak the nuptial bath, which precedes the wedding feast, which is the Eucharist. Christian marriage, in its turn, becomes an efficacious sign, the sacrament of the covenant of Christ and the church. Since it signifies and communicates grace, marriage between baptized persons is a true sacrament of the new covenant. So um, I'd like to uh, read some, some scriptures. So we're going to leave that there. We got up to about paragraph 16, 17. And let's turn over to the next page, page 4. Uh, this, is a, this is a passage everybody knows, right? Everybody knows this one. 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love is not pompous, it is not inflated, it is not rude, it does not seek its own interest, it is not quick-tempered, it does not brood over injury, it does not rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. If there are prophecies, they will be brought to nothing. If tongues, they will cease. If knowledge, they will be brought to nothing. But love will endure. Why? Because in heaven, we won't need any prophecies because everything will be fulfilled. Right? In heaven, you won't need knowledge because you'll have the knowledge of the union of, you know, with God. And so you'll have all kinds of knowledge. But what will still survive and what will still matter is love. Love is patient, love is kind, it is not jealous, it is not pompous, it is not inflated. Those are, those are beautiful descriptions. Um, I don't know if you've um, studied the, the, the letters of Paul. Uh, this man is full of the Holy Spirit because he describes things in such a profound way. He wrote it such a long time ago. He could have written this today. It would be just as valid. valid. Romans 12, let love be sincere, hate what is evil, hold on to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, anticipate one another in showing honor, do not grow slack in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, endure in affliction, persevere in prayer. By the way, the uh, letter of St. Paul to the Romans is like a, like a summary of all of his like, teachings. Because what he was trying to do is he was trying to impress the Romans. Because he was going to go there. So he wrote the letter in advance of going there, which is a common practice back then. He was trying to show, I'm, I'm, I'm legit. Like, I, I know about Christ. I've converted a lot of people. I've done all these things. And here's the theology that I've learned from from God himself. Because he learned theology from studying the Old Testament scriptures, but now he's, he's a disciple of Christ. So um, that is just full, full, full of teaching. Let love be sincere, hate what is evil, hold on to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, anticipate. So uh, someone who really loves anticipates. So what, if, what are, you know, you're coming home from work, you probably tired, I'm gonna anticipate. What can I do for you? Um, you know, uh, you, you're going to go to the hospital, so you're going to need a ride. You might need a change of clothes. Get that? Uh, you anticipate the need. It's very, 
is a beautiful way of uh, showing love. Do not grow slack in zeal. Do not grow sa- slack. I was cleaning snow, like many of you were, and I had cleaned all I could, and my breakfast had already run out of energy, and I just didn't have anything else left, but I wasn't finished. I got a big old driveway. Oh, I could just stop and then come back later. But then it'll be later, and who knows? It might it's no more. I go, oh no, I should just just press on. Do not grow slack and see. Marriage is not a sprint. It is a long, long marathon, hopefully very, very long. And you have to hold on. Hold on. There's, there's, there are going to be bad days. Hold on. Do not grow slack in zeal. So I pressed on. I, I think my shoulders uh, uh, are telling me that I maybe pressed on too long. But, but I finished. And because I finished, my wife didn't have to do it. Because I finished, my kids didn't have to do it. Because I finished, my parents who live with me did not have to do it. Your perseverance helps other people. Your perseverance matters. So do not grow slack in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. So when I stopped and I couldn't go anymore, and I put my head on my plow, Oh, Lord Jesus, I need some kind of help right now. Because I want to finish this, but I don't want to finish it. I just want to go sit down, watch football. Be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Yourself. No, it says serve the Lord. This is uh, more like advanced level. So one-on-one is like help your spouse. No, help your kids is probably even easier because they're more needy. Help your kids like one on one. Help your spouse like, you know, two o two. But serve the Lord. That's advanced level stuff. That's you need to go through some things before you get there. Why do the things that you do? Why do anything that's good? Because then if I scratch their back, they'll scratch mine. That is a very low, low level of like achievement. Yes, this is true, right? That happens, right? You scratch pe- people's back, they scratch yours. But uh, that's not the highest level, right? There's levels of love. And so a uh, much higher level would be for the, for the benefit of someone else, that'd be much better. Uh, another higher level would be because it's right. It's right. That's a higher level. But this is like way up there. You do it because you want to love God. And that's, when, when your life becomes like that, first of all, you're on a really good track. Okay, your, your life is, is, you know, the pearly gates almost in sight, okay? Because if you're doing stuff for the love of God, then it's not about you. Then it's not about your achievement. Then it's not about, can you, can you get a better looking whatever, truck than the neighbor, you know, like it doesn't, none of that matters. And what about, you know, like you get the worst job at work, you're like complaining, it's like, man, this sucks, I got the worst job, and I got, I've been here like four years, I don't get any respect, that is not the right path. Complaining, should be the 11th commandment, thou shalt not complain. That's terrible. Only bad things come from that because then you feel sorry for yourself, you feel mad at everyone. Um, you do it for the Lord. Like, I, this job is awful. I'm, I'm going to do it for the Lord. And the Lord's like, you're doing this awful thing for me? That is high level stuff. If you can do that, wow. You're going to be meriting a lot of grace. In fact, if you already do that, uh, I, I would uh, pr- request that you pray for me because I know that God is hearing you. God cannot be outdone in generosity. And if you do things for the love of God, for serving God, he will return to you 20, 30, 40, 100 fold what you're doing. That's how he is. And so I answer your prayers if you're ever like that. Okay? 
If you're not like that, don't feel bad. Okay? It's, it's a high level. Rejoice in hope, endure in affliction, and persevere in? Persevere in prayer. Yeah, that's my wife. Because we're good at prayer. Persevere in? Well, I'm really glad that somebody mentioned that uh, as some, in one of these early scripture passages. Um, we get so lost in this world, in our marriages, in, in every relationship, by all the problems, right? By all the, all the things that don't work out like how we want it. And so we're like in left field somewhere. Like, uh, I... I was going to be an architect, but I got an F, I'm drafting, and they said, you better switch, otherwise you're going to lose all your credits, and then I switch, and now I'm doing this job that I don't like, but I need to support my wife and my kids, and so I'm just doing it, and I don't like it, and my life is just not what I wanted it to be. And then everyone has things like that, right? Things don't go as, as you planned. Uh, with the kids, they don't go like you thought they would. So don't forget the end of this um, scripture passage from uh, St. Paul. Persevere in prayer. Even when you're in the darkest, deepest pit of your life and everything has gone wrong, you can still pray. Even when the, the reason that you're in the dark pit is your fault. Because it's easier when it's someone else's fault because at least you're not the one who made that dark pit. But if it's your fault, and you're, you made the pit, and you've made other people suffer, even that, even then, you can still persevere in prayer. I was reading a book on prayer. It said the only prayer that you always have access to is the prayer for help. You don't have access to other prayers. Uh, so when you're not right with God, then you lose a lot of things. Like, for example, if you're not in a state of grace, you should not be receiving communion. And that's a beautiful thing full of grace that you could receive, but you can't because you're not in the same grace. So that's sort of, you can't. But you can always pray for help, no matter how terrible you are or the situation is. So persevere in prayer. Persevere in prayer. Um, I prepare couples for marriage. And so my first question is, hey, so hey, so how did you meet? Tell me, tell me about that. And then they tell me, you know, oh yeah, you know, it was a blind date. Okay, all right. Some people met online, you know, who knows? And more and more and more nowadays is online. But and then I said, okay, well, sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, so that's wonderful. Um, tell me, why are you looking to get married in the church? Is it, yeah, that's a good question. I thought they're coming. Representative of the church. They have a date. Why do you want to get married in the church? Oh, and then they give you some good reasons. You're some pretty good reasons. No, I want, want God to bless our marriage, you know. Okay, that's good. And uh, tell me, um, do you pray? I, uh, I, uh, once in a while, yeah. Do you go to church? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm free. Oh, okay. So, um, let's just, let's just do this, let's, let's do this. While we prepare you for marriage, let's let's start praying every day. You know, just try. It. And also, I'd like to see you here on Sundays. So we got two parishes, so it could be either one. This one or the one over there. It's fine. We have masses in English and Spanish, so pick, pick your pick. They don't know the life of grace because if you miss mass, that's an obligation for Catholics. Missing Mass is a mortal sin. Mortal sin takes you out of the grace of God. You cannot merit grace in your mortal sin. You're essentially like an enemy of God. So I'm like, okay, let's rectify this. You know, I'm not a priest, so I can't confess you, but hey, here's Father's number. Why don't you call him and make an appointment and go to confession? This will go so much better if you do that. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? 
not only to learn that stuff, but then to practice it, to persevere in prayer. Colossians 3, put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If one has a grievance against another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also do. And overall, these put on love, that is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of Christ control your hearts and peace and the peace into which you were also called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as in, as in all wisdom you teach and admonish one another, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Okay, this is St. Paul again. If you notice the high level, this is a very high level of understanding of the things of God, a high level of uh, advice that he's giving to these people in Colossae. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How are you going to get the word of God to dwell in you richly? He didn't explain, but you guys can tell me. Huh? You read it. You read it. You read it. Uh, back then, it would, would have been, you listen to it, because they didn't have books, right? So you, you dwell on the word of God, you read it, you let it become part of your life, but as, as especially to dwell upon it. Dwell upon it, to think about it. Also, he noted, he mentions psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Where do we do that? Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs at Mass, right? They had Mass back then. By the way, uh, I used to teach church history, and uh, we went through the earliest recording, recorded, you know, like, outline of a Mass. It was like exactly the same as we do now. It, it, it was like from the year like 200 or 150 or something. And someone wrote it because they were, they were a teacher, they were telling their students, here's, here's what we do at Mass, and, this is, and they were trying to kind of teaching them, and they, that document was preserved. And uh, we do it just like that. We do it just like that. Okay, so they definitely had Mass. Um, Whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. My, my dad tells me that his dad, so my grandpa and her met him, that his dad would do everything in the name of Jesus. He was a farmer. So, you, you know, farming, wake up at crack of dawn, go to sleep, I mean, not go to sleep, but come back home when you can no longer work. That's, that was his life. In the name of Jesus. He would do that. He would go to work in the name of Jesus. You know, they had pigs. They had to slaughter the pigs. In the name of Jesus. He had to discipline them sometimes. My, my dad is one of uh, like six brothers. So they didn't always behave. They were also sisters. They also didn't always behave, but the, the boys were worse. So he had to reprimand them in the name of Jesus. He actually did it. He actually lived that way. And my dad remembers his dad. He was such a holy man. He was such a holy man. He was, he was, there was no deceit. There was no cunning in him. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's tough. That's tough. Because sometimes things come out of our mouths that we probably are not saying in the name of Jesus, right? So that's a good like, uh, like self check. Can I do this thing I'm about to do in the name of Jesus? I'm gonna go view something on the internet. Can I view this thing on the internet in the name of Jesus? <laughs> I'm about to reply to a post that somebody put on Facebook. Can I post this thing I'm about to write in the name of Jesus. And if I cannot, then maybe, maybe, I probably shouldn't put it. 
And then the last one, uh, last part there says, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Giving thanks to God. Another high, pretty high thing there. Why would you give thanks to God for breaking your leg? If you, let's say you, you know, accidentally in the snow, walked down your stairs and boom, 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 and broke your leg. Now your leg's broken. Why would you give thanks to God for that? You know this, because you've lived life for a long time. You've lived with many experiences, including painful ones like that. Why would that be a good thing? Or why could it be a good thing? One reason it could be a good thing, Deacon, is perhaps I was really arrogant about my dancing skills. <laughs> oh, I can shake, I can shake a leg, I can do everything, I'm better than you. And then break a leg, and then now, oh, the, the competition's coming, oh, and there it goes. And you didn't even participate. That is, so that I could gain humility. Right? If I'm disposed to it, if I'm disposed to it, I might not be disposed to it, I might, I might just complain, remember it's the 11th commandment. That's what I'm complaining. I could just complain about it and not get anything out of it, but perhaps, perhaps, God has given me a chance to grow in that way. What, what could be other reasons? There are, there are other wonderful reasons for breaking a leg. Give me other ones. Remind yourself to be thankful for the body. Ah, yeah, you took it for granted before. But now, every step, every, in fact, every just like change of elevation of the floor, you're like, oh. <laughs> you, haven't, you, know, you haven't got there just to the couch to give thanks for what you've got. In the same way, you know what? There are people who live like this every single day. And you're eventually going to get better, and those people are not going to get better. And you, you, you live like, like they live for a week or two or five or a month or two. And they have to live like that their whole life. That is a wonderful lesson. It's wonderful. Uh, also, if you got the busted leg, who's going to clean the snow? You're not doing it. Who's going to do it? Which, that might be a good thing, right? Who's going to do it? Well, well, I guess we could get the kids to do it. You know, they're old enough. You, know, you don't want to put the four-year-old to clean the whole driveway. But you, know, you might have to hire somebody. Or, I don't know. You have to find out a way. You're not almighty. That is a very good lesson. There's a million lessons from bad things. Million, million lessons. If we're disposed to learning the lesson, and that's why giving thanks to God is one of the fundamental Christian attitudes. Thank you, God. I have no idea why. I'm thanking you for this busted leg, but I know I should thank you, and so I thank you for whatever it is you're doing with me, which, to be honest, I don't know what it is. I mean, you don't have to be fake with God. You can be real with God. Okay? I don't really know what it is, but, but thank you. And this is awful. And I had to pay this guy 50 bucks to clean my snow. <laughs> and I needed that money for something else. You know, and so, you can be real with God. That's okay. He's, he's good with that. Okay, First Peter, finally, all of you, be of one mind, sympathetic, loving toward one another, compassionate, humble. Do not return evil for evil, or insult for insult, but on the contrary, a blessing. Because to this you were called, that you might inherit a blessing. How are you going to inherit this blessing that, that, that Peter is talking about here? How are we going to inherit this blessing that we were prepared for? By blessing those who insult us, do evil to us. I don't know if you ever had the chance. This is, this is a real question. You don't have to answer it. Okay, because it could be a little bit. If you ever had the chance of praying for someone who has hurt you, that is tough to do. Because your your own pride gets in the way and say, psh, psh, pray for them. Psh, they better come over here and apologize to me. 
then maybe I'll bring it for the, you know, like, like uh, that, that pride gets in the way. But without your prayer, maybe they'll never do that. But with your prayer, maybe, maybe someday. I don't know. But regardless, praying for someone that, that hurt you, that let you down, or whatever, isn't that the higher road? Right? As opposed to cursing them and I hope they crash. You know what I mean? Come on. <laughs> That's not good. It's not very godly. So then you, you say, um, you know, to pray for them. Well, and why does this come up in a, in, in a talk about marriage? Because in marriage, there are times when they let you down. Right? They let you down. And so you don't feel like praying for them. In fact, you're feeling like, man, you know, Josephine in the seventh grade was was pretty nice girl, and uh, she's still available. You know, like, <laughs> what? No. When things go, go, go south, when things go bad, you need to pray. Persist, persist persevere in prayer. Okay? You've heard, you've heard this one actually probably numerous times from Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one. They get a good wage for their toil. If one falls, the other will help the fallen one. But woe to the solitary person. If that one should fall, there is no other to help. Apparently they didn't have furnaces back when this was written. So also, if two sleep together, they keep each other warm. How can one alone keep warm? Where one alone may be overcome, two together can resist. A three-ply cord is not easily broken. And I, I just need to point out something here. Um, the enemy of our souls uh, detests marriage. Okay? The enemy of our souls detests love, detests kindness, any, any of those good things that we read in the first version. He detests all that. So, uh, he uh, does all his tricks to try to make us fall, right? The most easiest, most common, and most normal is temptation. Right? That's, a, that's the easiest, most common way that he tries to make us fall. And so there, there's all kinds of temptations. Um, and uh, he's had a lot of experience, right? Lots of years of learning how people work and stuff. And he knows us, because he knows our lives. Right? So then he tempts us with something that we would like. So. You know, if if you want an easier job because your job is tough, then you will find a way to someone offer you a job, but then there's a there's a catch. Like he is always doing some kind of underhanded stuff. Um, as a deacon, I counsel people just they just find me after mass. You know, hey deacon, can I talk to you? Sure. Oh uh, yeah. Um, I, I I have the next mass too, but oh yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, um, this is happening, happening, happening. And here's what I was thinking of doing, and it, it's like a terrible idea, you know? Okay, I'm, I'm, I was thinking that I would get even by doing this and this and this, and then they'll respect me. Have, have you given this a lot of thought? Yeah, yeah. This is like the best plan I've got. I'm like, okay. Okay, I'm, I'm really sorry to break it to you, but that's not the great plan. Not really, no. No. Uh, we should think about this, because what, was, what is the scripture that says? Two are better than one, right? Two are better than one. One alone may be overcome, but two together can resist. In that interaction, I was not going along with his plan, right? I was resisting. He was not resisting. In fact, I think he was just looking for approval, like, yeah, we're gonna go do this. But guess what happens when you talk to a bad friend? He talks to his bad friend. Hey, here's an idea. It was, I was thinking of doing it. Get even and blah, blah, and, and the friend is like, oh, that sounds wonderful. You're really conniving. That's like great. In fact, why don't you do this too? And, and it's like, you just made the thing worse. I am totally in favor of having holy friends who will tell you that is a terrible idea when, it, when it's a terrible idea. That will tell you, and hopefully, you can be that person for your spouse, and your spouse can be that person for you. Two together 
can resist. One alone is easy to convince. I've talked to lots of people. They're convinced that this is the right course of action. They've thought about it. They've meditated on it. They've, they looked it up on Google, and, and it's, it's a great plan. And I go, no, no, not really. I can't say I agree with that. And then we go talking about why don't I agree with their plan? Because the enemy had made them think it was a great idea. Just like um, in your marriages and in your relationships, you know, the enemy will make you think like, hey, I deserve better. Hey, I, I, I am not being treated right. I deserve better. Whenever anything begins with I deserve, that's already going down the wrong road. That's a very slippery road. Not going to end well. I deserve better. I this, I that. You know, me, 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 my, my, my. And that's, that's not, not going the right way. So, uh, You've already been kind of like duped, but you don't know because you feel like that's correct and good. So then you got to talk to somebody, talk to somebody, and get that holy friend on the phone, and then tell them, and then they'll tell you directly, right? Honestly, that is a terrible idea. How did you come up with that one? You know, it's good to have those kind of friends. All right, let's read uh, Proverbs. Do not, love, do not let love and fidelity forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and esteem before God and human beings. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. On your own intelligence, do not rely. In all your ways, be mindful of him. And he will make straight your paths. Amen. That is wonderful advice. But the part that I want you to focus on is the part that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Because um, we don't always understand things. It's actually kind of nice when we do understand something. It's very rare, right? Do you know your future? No. Do you know who's gonna be there in the future? Probably not. Do you know who's gonna help you get there? No. Do, what do you know? Uh, I know like her, I, I know him, that's about it. Okay, that's what you know. And for the rest of it, you need to, what does the scripture say? Trust, Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Oh, but they're but they're downsizing at our factory and our at our company and they're and they're they're getting rid of people and they're starting with the people with the least experience. And I've only been there two years. Uh, I'm I'm I I'm gonna be next. I, I know it. Okay, you may be next or Maybe they really like you, and they'll keep you around and increase your salary and probably your responsibilities since they're getting rid of people. Uh, you don't know. So, so since you don't know, you have to trust in the Lord. You know, uh, people develop all kinds of issues. You know, anxiety, depression, uh, OCD. There's so many things, right? And you're like, how am I going to get... Through this, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I can't find, I can't see a way. Okay, I know, I know. I've been there, I understand. You don't see a way. So when you don't see a way, you need to trust in the Lord. He is the way. In fact, Jesus said it so clear. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Ephesians 4, this is number 11, then page 5. I then, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live in a manner worthy of the call you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another through love, striving to preserve the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So Paul is writing this letter from prison. Okay? He's in prison. He was in prison a lot of times, actually, because they didn't like what he had to say. So he's in prison here. He's writing to the Ephesians, and he's telling them, I, then, a prisoner of the Lord. I'm right. Uh, prisons were a little bit different than now, though. Prisoners can write letters, not to. He was on, like, the low, not max security prison. Okay. I urge you to live in a manner worthy of the call you have received. 
worthy of the call you have received. This is where I wish I could talk to each and, each and every one of you. What is the call you have received? Because we all receive calls from God. You know, we're all uh, Samuel, right? We're all Samuel. God calls us. But what is he calling us to? What, what, what do you want from me? By the way, it's a wonderful prayer. What do you want from me? Uh, you know, maybe you say it in different words, but um, I say a prayer from St. Teresa of Avila, who's one of my patron saints. She's the doctor of the church. And she has a prayer that says, what do you want? What do you want of me? It's, it's, it's kind of like, it's beautiful. It's all about asking God to, to tell her what he wants from her, but in between all the stanzas, she's offering everything she has and is. Do you want me to, you know, go hungry? Okay. Do you want me to have opulence? Okay. Do you want me to sleep on the rocks? Okay. Do you want me to sleep on a bed? He like, she just gives everything, everything, everything. Just tell me what you want. It's beautiful. Because God calls you. He's calling you. And in that call, it, you're supposed to, and this is what Paul says from prison, live in a manner worthy of the call. So uh, our first call, of course, is baptism, right? So that we have a call to live like Christ, to be baptized, to be priest, prophet, and king. That's our first call. But the calls that come after that are uh, fruition, right? Blossoming of that original call. For example, um, anybody here um, have a big devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary? Anybody? If you do, that's just a flowering of your baptismal call. Because the baptismal call is to be holy and good and you know, a good Christian. And that's what Mary is. She's the first Christian, and she's really good at it. And she helped Jesus to become the man that he became. So she's a good example, and she's a guide as well. So it's a flowering of that same baptismal call. Live in a manner worthy of the call you have received. So baptism, then you receive the call if you're married to the married state, which I, like I said, I thought was going to be my last state until God called me to the diaconate. And I, I honestly, I just said, well, how about no? But you know what happens when you say no to God? Does God quit? That's what I guess is the question. He never, ever, ever, ever quits, right? It's what they call him the holy hound of heaven, right? So he's always after you. And he continued to insist. And I'm like, okay, okay. All right, I'll tell you what. I'll go to the discernment sessions, right? Because I thought I had already taken care of this back when I went to the ordination thing, uh, the priestly thing. And so I went to the the sermon sessions for the diaconate. And, you know, we're not, we're not going to be able to do this anyways because the wives have to participate. And my wife is busy. She's a doctor. She's on call. She's delivering babies. Yeah, he won't be able to do it. Yeah, but we'll go, you know, just to humor God. You know how it's, it's. So we went, and we just played along. And we went to the session. And they, they played videos, and there was a couple deacons there. And, like, the second or third class, or whatever, third session, they said something on one of the videos. The deacon is the icon of Christ in the world. And like a ton of bricks, that applies to me. That is a call. I could feel it. It was like a strong. It was really strong. And I'm like, oh, oh. Hey, Patty. I think we're going to have to apply. Because the discernment, you don't apply. You just go in. Whatever the sessions, you don't need to apply. So I think we're going to need to apply to see if this is this is the call. That what I felt in that third session. And, and by the grace of God, my wife became pregnant with twins while I was applying to the program. It's a kind of a long process. And so they interviewed us. So, Henry, 
wife looking pretty pregnant there. <laughs> she was really, really pregnant because the babies were born full size, not not creamy, you know, nothing, full size. Like our other babies were like six pounds, six ounces, you know, six pounds. This, this one was six three, six pounds three ounces, and the other one was six thirteen. So there was a lot of babies there. Okay, big. Okay. So, your wife's, um, why do you want to apply to be a deacon now? It seems to me that you got three little kids and two on the way here, uh, like you're busy enough already. I, go, I know, I know what you're saying, Jesse. That's what I was saying too. That's, that's what I was saying. Like, what I want to do is, I, I want to sit down and watch the Packers. That's, that's what I want to do. But God won't leave me alone. <laughs> Tucking at my heart, and and I, I, I have to say, I have to respond, and so then they start running down their little notebooks. Okay, so says that he has to respond while the wife is pregnant with twins. Okay, well we're gonna have an eye on you, Henry. I go. If you ever think like I shouldn't be in the program, go right ahead and. Send me home to watch the Packers. Because I don't know what else to do. He doesn't leave me alone. And so I went through the program. They were, uh, they were sincere with their threats. They did watch me. They put me on probation. But I wasn't making progress. You know. But I was awake, at least. I was not sleeping at night. Because the babies were born after the first semester. I was there. I did all the homework. I did everything. And they put me on probation. I'm like, well, thank you, God, for that probation. Now I gotta be with them more often. And I gotta do this, and I gotta do that. What is it that you want from me? Remember that prayer? St. Teresa of Avila? What do you want from me? The clearest day, he said, I want you to be my deacon. Are you kidding me? These people don't like me, they don't want me to be there. The reason that they didn't like me is I have advanced degrees in theology. I have a master's degree in theology, and I finished. I had finished all the classes for a doctorate, so I, I could have been teaching all those classes. But they had me take. And they said, you know, this guy's not going to make a good deacon because all these uh, uppity uppity, you know, theology guys. They just come in thinking they're going to do their own thing, and they'll be good. Uh, you know. And so after God told me that, in prayer, I started acting like a deacon, or whatever I thought a deacon was at the time. I started serving everyone. Deacon means servant. I started serving them. It was so humiliating. After all the bad things that had said about me. But that's what God wanted, so thank you, God. Let's go. And so I started helping them. <laughs> then they met with me later, like, you know, you're, you're making good progress. <laughs> I'm making good progress, okay. I am the same person I was before. Live in a manner worthy of the calling you have received. It is from God. It doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter what you know other families do. It doesn't matter what other couples, how they like go on a date every three days and, and you feel like a jerk and like it doesn't matter. You gotta live worthy to the call you have received. You know this person. You know what would make them happy. You know what kind of help that they need. Do it. Do it. I remember when I changed my first diaper, I'm like, holy smokes. That's terrible. <laughs> and they realized that it could be worse than that. And, uh, later, it could be explosive. <laughs> I didn't know that. Because so, my mom would never let me any, near any child, right? Because I was the youngest, of course, that's part of the problem. So I'm the youngest, and then any child that came within like 10 feet of me, it would be taken and taken care of by right? my mom and other little ladies. So when it was my turn, whew. but I had to live worthy 
of the call that I received. It's a beautiful thing. It's not easy. It is beautiful in the world. First John. By the way, John is a wonderful author. All of the book authors are awesome, but Paul and John, just amazing. Number 12. Children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in deed and truth. Some of you have the gift of gap. You can say a million things. And part of those things you say, like, I love you, and I care about you, and, I, and you're awesome. That's okay. You can say those things. That's good. That's great. But First John here says that you need to not just say it, not just love and word, but also in deed. All right. It was a really important one here I wanted to read before we get too close to the end. Okay, let's go with uh, 1642, which is on page three of your handout. 1642 in the blue. Um, by the way, I, I always make my handouts robust so you can take it home, keep reading, there's more material. You know, if we had like all day, all week, we could keep studying more and getting more sources, but um, this, this way you have something to read, to pray with, to study. Mm -hmm. Christ is the source of this grace, the grace that we need. Just as of, as of old, God encountered his people with a covenant of love and fidelity, so our Savior, the spouse of the church, now encounters Christian spouses through the sacrament of matrimony. That is not a small statement. Okay? Like God, in the Old Testament, encountered the people. How did, how did God encounter the people, remember? The, the tablets in the mountain, and Moses coming down from the mountain with the tablets and gave them the law. Did you guys uh, read that little detail that when, when Moses would go talk to God, his face would glow so bright that he would disturb people, so he put a little veil over his head, over his face, so they wouldn't be disturbed by basically the radiance of God that was reflected on him. Okay, it was a big deal, right? What was happening was a big deal, not to mention all the miracles, right? It had happened before that to get them out of Egypt. Okay, when, when the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that, like in the Old Testament, God encountered the people in a covenant of love and fidelity, and you, you have to keep all those things in mind, right? All the miracles in Egypt, the, the tablets, Moses shining. Um, you know, when they walked through the desert, there was a pillar of cloud that walked ahead of them. During the night, it was a pillar of fire so they could see. That is, that is a major miracle. Everyone could see the miracle, too. Okay? Um, I encourage you to watch any kind of movie about the Exodus that represents that. It's just, I mean. So now, okay, now, our Savior, the spouse of the church, encounters Christian spouses through the sacrament of matrimony. Christ dwells with them, gives them the strength to take up their crosses, and so follow him, to rise again after they have fallen, to forgive one another, to bear one another's burdens, to be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ, and to love one another with supernatural, tender, and fruitful love. In the joys of their love and family life, he gives them here on earth a foretaste of the wedding feast of the Lamb. That is not a small statement. That I mean, wow. So, so the covenant with, that God is making with us, He's making it through the vocations, right? And the vocation that most people have is a vocation of marriage. Yeah, ninety something percent, right? Marriage. So that's where he encounters them. Our vocation is the way that God like interacts with us. So if you're single and you always remain single, that is a vocation. Okay? The single vocation. If someone is an ordained priest or bishop or religious, that is their vocation. And within that vocation, God encounters them. And everybody thinks, oh yeah, of course, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I've read about the saints. They were holy people and God encountered them but we don't ever include ourselves in that. God encounters us 
in our marriage covenant. That is the new covenant. Okay? Christ is in that covenant, in that, in that sacrament, and he's there to strengthen us, right? He's, just, he's there so that we can have what it says here is supernatural love. That is beautiful. So how could someone possibly get supernatural love? Well, they're not going to get it on their own. They're going to get it from Christ. And that supernatural love is the kind of love that will, will do the work, will clean up the explosive <clears throat> number twos. So that the beloved doesn't have to do it. That would be higher, even higher, out of love for God. Okay? That is supernatural. It's not logical, right? Supernatural is higher than that. It's also tender. And it's fruitful. And if we do that, if we cooperate with Christ, if we take up our cross and follow him, we will have in our families a foretaste of the wedding feast of the Lamb. And the foretaste, and what is the wedding feast of the Lamb? What is describing? What's going to happen? In heaven. Heaven is described in scriptures as the wedding feast of the Lamb. If you, if you remember this, the scripture where, where the people who were invited didn't come, and he sent out servants, get whoever. Just tell them to come. And then they went and got whoever was, was willing to come to the uh, wedding feast of the Lamb. So heaven is described as the wedding feast of the Lamb, and we can get a foretaste of that in our families if we allow the grace of Christ to supernaturalize our love, our patience, our endurance. You know, all the qualities that he wants to give us in that first scripture that we read in First Corinthians. All right, now I want to leave with one scripture passage as well. On page six. Okay, I'm going to read two. Okay, here we go. So, the Gospel of John, I read to it, John was awesome. And I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one, as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be brought to perfection as one, that the world may know that you sent me, and that you love them, even as you love me. Okay, that's Jesus praying to the Father about us. So he's saying, Father, please, please, help them to be united. I in them, and you in me, so that we're united with God, right? So by being united with Christ, we're united with God, and then we can receive the glory that Jesus received. And that's that, that last scripture about the foretaste of, of the wedding feast. And then the last scripture there, Isaiah. And you will say on that day, give thanks to the Lord, acclaim his name, among the nations make known his deeds, proclaim how exalted is his name, sing praise to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known throughout all the earth. So that scripture passage is talking about once your faith comes, because this is the Old Testament, right, Isaiah? So this is the Old Covenant. If you could become, you know, faithful to that covenant, I'm positive that God would do good things for you, right? And if you can do that, then you can proclaim to all the nations how good God is. He is so good. He is so wonderful. And I think the same thing could be said about our family. That if we could live in a way worthy of our call, then we will, we will receive that grace from Christ so that we could proclaim to other families and we, we could proclaim to other couples that, you know what? God is good. He's done glorious things. I'll tell you one little story and we'll finish with this. So my mom is a very religious person and I think uh, some of your parents were, or grandparents, and uh, she had three kids, so my brother, my sister, and myself, uh, my brother was the oldest, 
but he was very sickly, as I told you. He suffered what we thought at the time was a stroke. And the doctor said, uh, he's not gonna make it. So you should call the family and have them come in and say their advice, good advice. Of course, you know, my family's from Puerto Rico, so they flew in and they said they, they were saying their advice. But my mom was praying. She's a third order Franciscan. She was praying to St. Francis to heal her boy. And she was in the waiting room one day. She never left the hospital outside the ICU where they had him. And she says that she looked over and she saw a little man dressed in brown. First, knowing that she's a third order Franciscan, you can imagine who that might be. She saw a little man dressed in brown and the little man went through the, you know, those doors. Back then it was less secure, right? So they just slide back and forth. And he went through the doors towards the bed where my brother was. She says that next to him, on either side, were two men uh, dressed in white. They're very tall. And she, she said that the little man dressed in brown told one of the tall men to kind of move over to the side so that he could get, get closer to my brother. And uh, she says that he, that the little man dressed in brown look, looked at her and looked at my brother and put his hand on my brother. And then, uh, you know, the doors probably closed. And when they opened again, everybody was gone. Or she didn't see anything else. But what she did is she felt different. She didn't see anything else, but she felt different. She felt like my brother was going to make it. And uh, after that day, she didn't cry anymore. And she was just constantly crying, crying, crying. And uh, my brother went out. Uh, got out of the ICU, went into a regular room for like a month, and then we brought him home, and he had to relearn everything. He had to relearn to talk, to walk, to eat, to tie shoelaces. And I remember helping him, thinking, he's, he's my older brother. He should be helping me with that. And so he recovered slowly. It was, it was a long process of, uh, we, we used to push him around in a wheelchair and stuff. And uh, maybe a year, maybe a little more than a year later, if you saw him, you wouldn't know that anything had happened to him, except for he had a little bit of a tremble in his hand. That's about it. He could speak, do all his normal things. And so my brother lived and, and he's, he's now passed away. My brother lived from that day or from that year. I did the calculations to when he finally passed away, 33 years. And then uh, I'm the deacon at the funeral, right? So I'm, I'm reading the scripture and I'm, I'm just doing the homily. And it hit me, and that's how old Christ was when he died. And, uh, 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 you know, God gave him back to us for like a whole lifetime, more after that. And uh, I'm not saying that God's going to do that in your family. I have no idea what he's doing in your family. But God does wonderful things. God can do amazing things that we don't deserve or expect because he's God. And if Hopefully you have a chance to reread these, these things that I've printed out here for you. To persevere in prayer. To, to trust in the Lord. For He is good. It's going to be okay. It's, everything's so tough in families. So tough. It's going to be okay. Those were wonderful years to my brother. Uh, he, when he recovered, he was pretty, pretty, pretty well, and he was able to live his life. He, he eventually got married uh, to a nurse, no less, who took care of him for the end.
Yeah, God is really easy. God is just really easy. And so I hope that you've learned something about God and about the covenants that he makes with us, about how the sacraments are all, all intertwined with that, how following Christ is, in fact, the way. It is the way to live. And, and certainly the more difficult it is, the more likely it is we need to remember that. So I'd like to give you my blessing. Um, I do have to run because I have another appointment. Um, but the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God, through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph, through the intercession of our guardian angels and patron saints, may that blessing fall upon each and every one of you, upon your family members and friends. And that blessing give you health of body and peace of soul and remain with you forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the invitation and for your patience with me as well. Thank you. Thank you.